welcome again to our series of messages on revival. I want to remind you that these messages are actually aimed at preparing our hearts so that we can have hearts that are in right condition where the Lord Jesus Christ can come and actually dwell. These are not messages for those who have not yet encountered the Lord Jesus Christ because uh, someone who does not yet have the law cannot know what a revival is because a revival means bringing back to life. It is those who have this personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and the Lord Jesus Christ is actually dwelling in their hearts and who realize, they realize that the life that they are living is actually different from the life that they don't want them to live. In other words, the life of God is not fully being manifest in their lives and God cannot use them fully the way he ought to use them. Because revival means bringing back to life that which has died. The unbeliever does not yet have the Lord Jesus Christ. So there is literally nothing to be brought back to life. What actually he needs to do, someone who does not yet have the Lord in him need to do, is to surrender his life to the Lord Jesus Christ, have the Lord Jesus Christ on the throne of his heart, and cooperating now with God to uproot every single thing that ought to be uprooted from his life. This is our eighth message in this series. And today, we will actually be talking on freedom from self-centeredness. Freedom from self-centeredness. If you are joining us for the first time in this series of messages, we will advise you equally to go through, listen to the first seven messages that we have already shared on this series. And the messages that we have already shared are freedom from all sin, freedom from all love of self, freedom from all love of the world and the love of the things in the world, freedom from falsehood, freedom from sexual immorality, freedom from all love of gain. And our last message of this series was freedom from a divided heart. So we are actually saying that all sin needs to be uprooted, all self-life needs to be uprooted, all that has to do with the world, the love of the world, the love of the things in the world need to be uprooted, all that has to do with falsehood, sexual immorality, the love of gain need to be uprooted, and a man should come to that position that his heart is totally surrendered to the law. And today we are talking about freedom from self-centeredness freedom from self-centeredness man without the Lord Jesus Christ in his heart and being guided and ruled by the Holy Spirit is fundamentally a self-centered person and that's who man is without the Lord Jesus Christ having taken the throne of his heart and without the Holy Spirit ruling over his life man is fundamentally a self-centered person and his life is characterized by the I, I, me, mine and that's the characteristic of a life where the Lord Jesus Christ is not on the throne of the heart, the life of a person that is not being ruled, governed by the spirit of God. His language is I, mine, me. And that's what the self-life is. It's a life that is characterized by a person constantly thinking about himself. Everything is himself. Everything is mine. Everything is me. Everything is I. His action, his attitude, his words, his relationships are always turning around himself. He's always thinking of what to benefit from all that he is doing. So that's what the self-life, self-centeredness is. A life that is caught up with benefit, personal benefit, before anyone can benefit from him. Self-interest. 
So self-centeredness is an attitude of being totally concerned with one's own interest. Constantly concerned with your own interest above the interest of God and above the interest of others. A self-centered person wants everything to rotate around him or rotate around her. So that's what self-centeredness is. Always wanting everything, everyone, and the whole world to rotate around you. You are the center. You want to be the center of the universe. And unfortunately, since it is not possible for you to be the center of the universe, you are constantly reacting because it is not possible for everyone's life to begin to turn around you. They are concerned solely about their own interests. They lack consideration for anyone else. That's what a self-centered person is. Self-centered people are constantly concerned about their interests. They don't care about the interests of anyone. If they think about their interests, they are always asking themselves, what will I gain out of it all? They are chiefly concerned with their own personal profit and personal pleasure. And the one topic they have is themselves. That's their one topic. Everything is talking about themselves. And the one needy person they know is themselves. Their one topic themselves. The one needy person they know is themselves. And the one urgency, if there is anything that is urgent, everything, the urgency is themselves. And if, if there is one busy person, they are the only person who, who is busy, who should be busy. So they want everything to turn around them. They are madly, they madly crave for attention from others. Self-centered people, thinking only about their own interests, thinking only about their own profit, thinking only about, oh, what can I gain out of this? They don't think that anyone else deserve any attention except themselves. They don't think that anyone else has need except themselves. They don't think that anyone else's time can be wasted except them, their time. They don't think that anyone else can be busy except themselves. That is a self-centered person. Such a person is selfish, egocentric, and he wants everyone and the whole world to think of them first. Selfishness, full of self, and they are constantly wanting everyone to think about them. They always view themselves as better than others. Self-centeredness, wanting the whole world to be around you. Wanting the whole world constantly to think about your needs. You think about the need of no one, everybody should think about your need. You think about wasting nobody's time, everybody should think about your time that is being wasted. So that everyone must give you attention, and if nobody gives you attention, then you will act violently. We're going to look at biblical examples in order to understand what does the Bible say about self-centeredness. Do not forget the fact that we are actually studying on revival and asking ourselves what can we do in order to prepare ourselves and present hearts that the Lord can actually come in, dwell in, possess such hearts and begin to use such hearts to do exploit. Preparing hearts where the Lord can be able to say this person's heart qualifies for me to come and stay in. And as we said, we are asking, what are the things that need to be uprooted? Sin need to be uprooted. Self need to be uprooted. The world need to be uprooted. Falsehood need to be uprooted. Sexual immorality need to be uprooted. Divided heart and need to be uprooted. And we are confronting the fact that we also need to uproot all that have to do with self-centeredness. And we have said a self-centered person wants the whole world to protect around them, around him. He wants to be at the center. He wants to be the center of attraction. He wants to be the one person to be cared for. He wants to be the one person to be remembered. 
He wants to be the one person to be protected. He wants to be the one person for people to give to. He wants to be the one person. He wants to be at the center and every other person and the whole universe of protecting around him. Let's open our Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. We are trying to look at some biblical examples, some biblical examples of people who were self-centered and those who were not self-centered, so that we can understand what self-centeredness is all about. Open with us to Philippians chapter 2, verse 19 to 22. Philippians chapter 2, verse 19 to 22. Paul said, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive views about news about you. Listen to verse 20. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. No one else like Timothy who will show genuine concern for your welfare. In verse 21 it says, for everyone looks for their own interest, not the those of Christ. But you know that Timothy has proven, has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. As a son with the father, he has served with me in the work of the Lord. He said, Timothy who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. Timothy who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. He said, for others, they are always thinking about their own interests. So Timothy was different. He had a genuine interest about the welfare of these people. But Paul said, all other people, they are always thinking about their own interest. And that is what man is. Majority of people, it is rare to have a person like Timothy. Majority of people in relationship, they are always thinking about their interests. Majority of people in ministry, they are thinking about their own interests. Their own people, majority of people, if they are praying for somebody, they are asking, what will I gain out of this? If they are ministering, what will I gain out of this? That was not Timothy. Timothy, Paul said, like a son with his father, he has served with me in the gospel. And that's what serving God is meant to be. We serve, we are supposed to serve God by having a genuine interest, not in our welfare, but in the welfare of others. So Timothy was different. While everyone was caught up with his own interest, he took a genuine interest in the welfare of others. Again, in the book of Philippians, chapter 3, Paul talks again about another group of people. Let's look again, Philippians chapter 3, from verse 17 to 19. Paul said, join together in following my example, brother, and just as you have us as a mother, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the gospel. Their destiny is, in, is, their, is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly thing. Paul was telling these people, look at us as an example, because there are many people who are always thinking about their, themselves. Their God is their own stomach. And Paul said, I say it with pain. I say it with tears. So the self-centered people bring a lot of pain to God's heart. So there are those who are self-centered. They think about their interests. There are those who are not self-centered. They think about the interests of others. So Timothy was not self-centered. This group of people, they were self-centered. And Paul said, everyone 
thinking about their own interests. Let's again look at two other examples. Lord in his relationship with the uncle Ab Abraham. Open with us to Genesis chapter 13, verse 8 to 11. Genesis chapter 13. There was a problem between the headsmen of Abraham and the headsmen of Lord. Let's just read here and then see between these two people who was self-centered and who was selfless. From verse 8, Abraham said to Lord, let's not have any quarreling between you and me or between your headsmen and mine, for we are close relatives. Is not the whole land before you. Let's part company. If you go to the left, I will go to the right. If you go to the right, I will go to the left. Verse 10. Lord looked around and saw the whole plain of the Jordan towards Zohar, so that the whole plain of the Jordan towards Zohar was well watered like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Listen to verse 11. So Lord chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out towards the east. The two men parted companion. What I was seeing here, that when there was a problem, there was somebody who took a step, who took the initiative in order that the problem may be solved. He said they should not be quarreling. Self-centered people don't care whether there is quarrel around or not. Those who are selfless, they always take initiative to ensure that there is peace. And that's what Abraham did. And then Abraham told Lord, if you choose right, I will take the left. If you choose the left, I will take the right. And that's what a selfless person is. And the Bible said, Lord looked around. He looked at the whole plain of the Jordan. And then he saw that the land was well watered. And the Bible said, unfortunately, about the Lord, who had been taken care of by his uncle Abraham for all these years, and who had been made rich by his uncle Abraham, the Bible said, Lord chose for himself all the fertile land. And that's what self-centeredness is. Taking the best for yourself and making sure that other people have that which is not the best, what we call the worst. Lord chose all. He could have cut a portion and say, my uncle, this land is well watered. I will choose half. You will choose half. But Lord said, why should I give him any good part of the land? A self-centered person does not think about the interests of others. He is always concerned about his own interests. Choosing the best for himself and leaving the worst for others. Unfortunately, Lord did not know that what he called the worst left for Abraham was where the will of God, the purpose of God was going to protect. And he did not know that the land that he chose for himself, thinking that that was the best, was land that was destined to be destroyed by God. Because the people there were living a life that was reckless, a life that was not pleasing to God. So we see here the self-centeredness of Lord. He chose the best for himself. Why don't you ask yourself, in everything, are you always considering picking the best for yourself? You are serving on the table with others. You choose the best part for your best part of the meal for yourself. You are dividing something. You always want to be the first. You always want to be, to be considered the best. Into it, maybe into a taxi or into a vehicle, you always want to take the best and leave the, that which is not the best for others. That's exactly what the life of Lord was. He was unmindful of his uncle who brought him up. Here we see what the, 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 the life that is delivered from self is. It always takes initiative to ensure 
there should be no quarrel between us. A life that is separated from self-centeredness ensures that there is peace, there is serenity around. Whenever you find quarrels, whenever you find a lot of fighting, it is actually saying that most of the people who are there, they don't know a selfless life. So, Abraham led Lord to choose to make the choice. Then Abraham accepted the worst that was left for him. A selfless person, someone who had been delivered and set free from self-centeredness. He does not fight. He knows that out of the worst, God can give him the best. Self-centeredness is the mark of immaturity. Immature people, they are self-centered. That is what God demonstrated here. Think about children. When you are relating with children, children are always thinking about their interest. Give me this. Do this for me. What will you bring for me? What, what, what will you give me? Etc. They are never thinking, what am I giving to my own parent? Self-centeredness is a mark of spiritual immaturity. And when people are self-centered, you will see a lot of fighting, a lot of quarreling, a lot of disagreement. There is always no harmony because everybody is thinking about himself. Let's look at it from the book of James, chapter 4. James makes it, makes it very clear that where there is quarreling, where there is disagreement, it is because there is something working within. James, chapter 4. From verse 1, just verse 1. What causes fight and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? The desires battling within, within you is what causes fight, is what causes quarreling, is what causes division. It is, this, uh, it is that which is breaking many churches apart. It is what that shatters relationship. It is what that, that is breaking marriages, self-centeredness. The husband wants his own way, the wife her own way in the church. Members, leaders, each person wants his own interest. So that there are very few people like Timothy who are thinking about the interest of the Lord. James says it is that desire battling within you. And that desire battling within you is called a self-centered life. So all the quarrels and fighting among believers all the quarrels and fighting in, in families, all the quarrels and fighting in churches, all the quarrels and fighting, all the divorce, all those, just one thing, that thing that was battling within the self-centeredness. So that you get people with divorce, they don't care. What will happen to the children? What will happen to this wife? What will happen to this husband? What, I am separating myself from this person. What will happen to him? Everybody ought to have, everybody is thinking about my own life. No one cares even about the children. That is what self-centeredness is all about. So Lot was self-centered. Let's look at again at another example in the Bible of a self-centered person, a self-centered leader. The book of Third John, the book of Third John, open with us. Third John. It has just one chapter, verse 9. Take John, verse 9 and 10. Let's open there. The Apostle John said, I wrote to the church. We are looking at another a leader called Diotrephes who was self-centered. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be fast, will not welcome us. Another version said it will have nothing to do with us. So when I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, spreading malicious nonsense, malicious slander about us. Not satisfied with that, he even refused it to welcome other brothers. He also stopped those who want to do so and put them out of the church. So there was this man, Diotrephes, the Apostle John wrote to the church, Diotrephes would not permit anyone to read the letter. Diotrephes said, I don't want anything to do with those so-called apostles. 
and that's one of the mark of a self-centered person. He has nothing to do with leadership because he always wants to be the leader. He always wants to be seen as first. Here he says, the out of his, who always want to be first. Self-centered people, they don't know authority. They don't know leadership. They are always trying to rebel with people that are below them so that they will lord it over them. So the atrophies will not welcome the believers. He was afraid if you welcome someone, somebody may come and has a message that may touch the brethren and maybe as they go, they will begin to wonder, maybe there's something better somewhere. The atrophies did not want to be there with anyone. And if you welcome somebody, the atrophies send you out of the church. He had no leader. He wanted to be the almighty in that church. He wanted to be the first. He wanted to be the God in that church. That is a self-centered person. We have looked at the atrophies. We have looked at Lord. We have looked at these other groups who were always thinking about their self-interest. And, and I believe that just from those examples, we have understood what self-centeredness is all about. Always thinking about your own interests, wanting air, wanting you always to be at the center, always at the center of the attraction, the center of the conversation, the center of everything that is good, wanting to be the one person to be cared for, wanting to portray as you are the only person who has needs, you are the only person who should be listened to, you are the only person whose time should be protected while you waste the time of others. That's a self-centered person. A self-centered person, even in his prayer, he is always asking, he approaches the presence of God, God give me this, God give me this, God give me this. He will never ask, I am giving this, but God will give me this. What does God ever want from me? What can I ever give God? To him, God is God. God, God needs nothing. A self-centered person always thinks that he's the only one who needs, other people don't need anything. What does God himself want from us? Does he want us to continue to be self-centered? What is God's desire for, for us? Let's open our Bibles again to the book of Philippians. It is not God's desire that we should continue to be self-centered. Philippians chapter 2. The book of Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Verse 3 and 4. He said, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. That's what God wants for, for us. He said, do nothing out of selfish ambition. A self-centered person has selfish ambition so that he may do the external, what he is doing outwardly may be good, but when you go to the heart, God who knows the heart knows that his ambition, the reason why he is doing it is for himself. It is not for the interest of that person. It's not for the, uh, just he's doing the thing for. He's not even for God. It is himself. It is his profit. It is his own interest. And then the apostle said, in humility, value others better than yourself. A self-centered person always value himself above others. Somebody who has been free from self-centeredness, he value others above himself. A self-centered person always looking to his own interest and what God wants from us is that we look not only to our own interest but we look to the interest of others. So God wants us to know freedom from self-centeredness no longer looking at our own interest but in everything in every relationship you are asking what is the interest of this person? What can I do to be a blessing to this person? Not always asking, what can others need to bless me? Others need to be a blessing to me. Let's look again 
at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we are looking, what does God desire for each and every one of us? 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 24. Sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 24. He said, no one should seek his own good, but the good of others. No one should seek his own good for the good of others. A self-centered person is seeking for his own good. The person delivered from self-centeredness is seeking for the good of others. Just imagine that in your relationships, in all your relationships, you are not seeking your own good. You are constantly seeking out for the good of those with whom you are relating. In ministry, you are not thinking about your own benefit. You are thinking about the benefit of those to whom you are ministry. In everything, whether in the home, if it's in marriage, you are not thinking about your own good. You are thinking about the good of your partner. At the place of work, you are not thinking about your own good. In business, you are not thinking about your own good. You are thinking about the good of your client. You have become a servant in the hands of the Lord. And the Lord will mightily use you. The Lord will be able to flow through you and the Lord will touch the life of many people because you have become a selfless person. And that's who the Lord Jesus Christ is. That's who the Lord Jesus Christ is. That the person who could leave heaven and come down to earth, not because he has committed any sin, not even because we loved him. The Bible says it is not that we loved, we first loved him, but that he loved us and laid down his life for us. Not that we first loved him. Self-centeredness is sin. It is the manifestation of the lordship of the self-life upon the heart. It indicates that self is the Lord and not the Lord Jesus Christ. That the preoccupation of the heart, the person upon the throne of the heart is self. Jesus is not on the throne of the heart. In fact, every sin a man commits is self-centeredness. When a person commits sin, at that particular time, he's constantly thinking about his interest. He does not ask, how is my sin going to affect God? How is my sin going to affect the interests of God? How is my sin going to affect the people of God? How is my sin going to affect my family? How is my sin going to affect this nation? Corruption is self-centeredness because people are not asking. Now in my nation, I am working in this hospital. If I steal this money, how many people will die? How many children will come and will not be able to have medicine in this hospital because I've squandered uh, through my corrupt heart. I've squandered all the money. Look at so many people riding so many big cars. There are big houses all over the place. Not because they actually had the money. They stole the money of the nation. That is actually what self-centeredness is. And that is sin. Not thinking about the good of others, but always thinking about your own good. You don't care. In crisis period, people, you, you, you are doing everything to benefit. You are not asking, what can I sacrifice in order that the people around me may benefit? The people going through this crisis may benefit. So that massive sum of money that the nation has, but look at many nations. There, there, there are no services. The roads are poor. Hospitals are, are breaking down. Machines are not there. Doctors are not being well paid. Teachers are not being well paid. Why? Self-centeredness of some corrupt leaders. A self-centered person is a sinner. And every sin is self-centeredness. If people were thinking, this, this stealing, I am stealing this person's money, how will the person feel? I am stealing this person's phone, how will the person feel? I am I'm, I'm doing this, committing this sin, how will the people attached to me, how will it affect them? If people were delivered from self-centeredness, sin would end. A self-centered person lacks love for anyone. The only person he loves is himself. He wants to be given, but he gives to nobody. 
He's constantly desiring to be given, but he gives to nobody. He wants to be praised, but he praises nobody. He wants to be congratulated, he congratulates nobody. That is sin. What does God want from us? Or what does God want of us? God wants every one of us to be set free from the stronghold of self, of self-centeredness so that he can possess our heart and begin to use us to accomplish great things. So that we can become servant, we can become weapons in his hands. The ex from the life of the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Philippians chapter 2, we can actually know how a person can be delivered from self-centeredness. Let's open our Bibles again to the book of Philippians chapter 2. We will start again from verse 3. The book of Philippians chapter 2, we have read verse 3 and 4 already, but we shall repeat it again. He said, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility value others above yourself. Not looking at your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. Verse 5, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset or the same attitude of Christ Jesus. He said, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be done, something to be used to his own advantage, rather he made himself nothing. And by taking the very nature of a servant, he made in human likeness, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above all names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There are a number of things here that come out very clearly for anybody who wants to be delivered from self-centeredness. The first thing is, do nothing out of selfish ambition. What is selfish ambition? Selfish ambition is the reason uh, why you are doing something. Do nothing just for yourself. In everything, ask yourself, the people for whom I am doing this thing, how will they benefit? Do nothing out of selfish ambition. If you want to be delivered from the self-life, overthrow selfish ambition. Let your ambition always be, or your motive, your motive, your motive should always be God and others, not just yourself. From what we read here, he said, consider others better than yourself. And the reality is that in many cases, you actually, if you were to know the life of others, many people are better than you, except that they have decided to hide their greatness within. Look at the great God coming down to relate with us. He said, in everything, always consider others better than yourself. If you want to be delivered from self-life, of root selfish motive from your heart, selfish motive, self-centered motive, always decide, tell yourself other people are better than me. Number three, look not only to your own interest, but always ask, what will cause the interest of others? How can I protect the interest of others? That's what we see here. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. If you are married, you will think about the interest of your, your, your husband or the interest of your wife. If at place of work, you are thinking about the interest of your clients, you will be different. The Bible talks about the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, being in the very nature of God, he did not consider that equality with God something to be grabbed, but met himself nothing. You will need to renounce your self-importance. Renouncing your self-importance. Yes, you are important, but stop treating the others just because you are based on your importance. Renounce.
renounce it. Renounce your self-importance. Then accept the position of a, a servant. Look at the Lord Jesus Christ. God taking the form of man and then coming down in order to wash, in order to serve man. Take the, the, the position of a servant. Then the, decide, renounce the desire to seek great things for yourself. The Bible tells us in Jeremiah chapter 45 verse 5, he said, do you seek great things for yourself? Seek them not. Don't seek great things for yourself. Seek great things for the Lord. Seek great things for others. Set out that your promotion will not be you laboring to promote yourself. Like in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ here, the Bible says he took the form of man, humbled himself, and then died the death on the cross, and God exalted him. Tell yourself your promotion will not be because you have trampled on others, you have destroyed the name of others to make a name for yourself, you have used others. Let God promote you as a reward or selfless service that you render to others. Set out to please God and to please others, and don't set out to please yourself. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 15. Just open your Bible to Romans chapter 15. We are looking at the example of the Lord Jesus Christ, verse 3. He said, For even Christ did not please himself, as it is written. The insult of those who insult you have fallen on me. Don't set out to be the one who will be pleased. Don't set out to push insult always to others, to push blame always to others. He said Jesus did not set out to please himself. Set out that you accept the blame. Set out you accept the insult. Set out not to justify yourself. You are not always right. Even if you are always right, even if people know that you are wrong, before God, God knows that you are right. What are you to do? Repent of every manifestation of self-centeredness in your life. Every manifestation of self-centeredness in your life. Repent of every manifestation of self-centeredness in your life. Are you the one who always wants to be served? Are you all the one who always wants uh, to be spoken about? Confront all those manifestations and one by one purify your heart. Repent of them. The reality is that the, the, the secret for freedom from self centeredness is what we are saying now. Accept the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the cross. Embrace the suffering, accept the cross. It is the cross. The Lord, when the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross, He took us along with Him. And as He was being crucified, we were crucified. Embrace the cross and accept to die daily in everything. Deny yourself. The Lord Jesus Christ says, If you want to be anyone who wants to follow me, must deny Himself. Take up his cross and follow me. That's where a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ is. Decide that you'll be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Deny yourself daily. Deny yourself, deny your interest. Deny your name, being the only one to be able to be spoken. Uh, praise, deny. You should endure praise. Endure the praise of men. Don't give yourself to be feeding yourself to be in joy and seeking for prayer. Live for the glory of the Lord. Then embrace the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ, there's a reason why the Lord Jesus Christ died. Let's open our, our Bibles to 2 Corinthians. Embrace the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ died in order that you may no longer live for yourself, but for him who died for you. 2 Corinthians, the book of 2 Corinthians, Chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. We are going to read. For Christ's love, Christ's love compel, compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and 
then for all die. Verse 15 says, He died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. You tell yourself, the reason the Lord Jesus Christ died, and the reason why I'm saved, the reason I've surrendered my life to the Lord Jesus Christ, is that I no longer live for myself. I will live for the Lord Jesus Christ, and living for the Lord Jesus Christ is actually living for the Spirit and for these people for whom He gave His life. So we are saying, do like the Lord Jesus Christ did. Don't just be thinking about your importance. Renounce your importance. Renounce your greatness. Take the form of a servant. Be willing to die. Embrace the cross. Set out and, just, and tell yourself, you will seek great things no longer for yourself. You will seek great things for the Lord. Ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit. As you have overthrown the self-life, uprooted the wrong things in your life, and set out to, that your priority will be right. And your priority is living no longer for yourself, living for him who died for you. If you have repented, embrace the cross and told yourself that you will, have, you will renounce the self-life daily and at every point in time you should do something. Ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to do so every day. Ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us, walk in the Spirit and you will not gratify the desire of the sinful nature. And one of the desires of the sinful nature is self-centeredness. Ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit. After you have done this repentance, after you have renounced the self-life, after you have uprooted this self-interest, self, self -interest, ask that the Holy Spirit will fill you as you commit yourself to live for the Lord. Because it is the presence of the Holy Spirit within you that will help you to constantly say no to this self-life. The Holy Spirit came to bring glory to the Lord. And therefore, if you have truly opened your heart to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you will find yourself living now, no longer seeking for your own personal glory, but you will be seeking the glory of the Lord, and you will be seeking to be used by God to be a blessing for others. You will be seeking to be an ambassador of the Lord, representing the Lord in all things, and therefore, you will have no total freedom from the self-life. The self-life within you, that is manifest itself through self-centeredness, will be overthrown, and in everything, self-centeredness will never appear again in your life. The tragedy of self-centeredness is that no self-centered person can ever be happy. We are not happy by people doing things for us. We are happy by rendering service to others, reaching out to others. A person who gives himself in, to serve, who gives himself to bless rather than being blessed, who gives himself to give out rather than receiving, the, the spirit of God within him will be excited. No self-centered person can ever live a happy life. If you want to live a happy, joyful life, just embrace the pathway of selflessness. Set out to serve and not to be served. Set, set out to let others be fast and not living fast. Set out to be a blessing to others, even if you have to suffer in return. What will happen? You have just chosen to be a representative of the Lord and the Lord himself, as he did with the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, for this reason, God lifted him and put him, set him in the highest place and gave him the name that is above all names. Those who have been set free from self centeredness have been promoted. God will promote you. You don't promote yourself, God will promote you. God will make your name great. You don't make our names great. God will lift you high and God will set you and you will constantly be a source of blessing to multitude. That is the pathway of true joy, true happiness is in selflessly giving yourself out.
but if you want to know pain, if you want to know frustration, this inner frustration embrace the self-centeredness and continue to walk in self-centeredness. We encourage you, set out and know this life free from self-centeredness and the Lord will come and do 